um, taking conventional high dose levels of antioxidants can actually negate the benefits of exercise because well we don't well we don't really know exactly the reason but but again some of the research would suggest maybe it's because we we get all this uh yeah, this increased free radicals which we need as second messengers to induce these changes but then by taking a whole bunch of antioxidants we're essentially indiscriminately neutralizing all the good signaling ones the good and the bad do you want to know what it is body mind empowerment get stronger faster smarter quicker friendlier more helpful more driven everything the body needs control your mind Welcome to the Body Mind Empowerment Podcast. I'm your host, Seamland, and our guest today is Tyler LeBron. Tyler is the founder and executive director of the Molecular Hydrogen Institute. He's the world's leading expert on molecular hydrogen and how it can affect health, aging, and stress resilience. This episode is brought to you by Katsu Training. Katsu bands incorporate blood flow moderation training that trick the body into thinking that it's lifting heavier weights than it actually is. When traditional weightlifting requires you to reach 70 to 80% of your one repetition maximum to stimulate muscle hypertrophy, then Katsu achieve that effect only at 20 to 30%. So it's perfect for treating injuries or use when you don't have access to heavy weights. Research about Katsu bands also shows it lowers blood pressure, speeds up recovery from injuries, releases stem cells, builds muscle, burns fat, and prevents age-related muscle loss. These things are a game changer and I use them almost every day. If you want to try out the Katsu cycle bands, then use the code SEAM for a 10% discount at katsu-global.com. That's katsu-global.com and the 10% code is SEAM, S-I-I-M. Tyler, welcome to the show. Ah, thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah. It's uh, glad to finally talk with you, and uh, we've been trying to come up with a time where we can talk about uh, molecular hydrogen, so uh, it's been a long time coming, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a good uh, podcast. Yeah, I'm looking forward to discussing some of the, the things we found about molecular hydrogen, so uh, absolutely. Yeah, like, like, well, I would, I would imagine like a lot of the people don't really know about what is molecular hydrogen and um, like what are the benefits and so on, so maybe can you give us like a brief overview of what it is and how does it work? Yeah, yeah, great. yeah. That's, that, that's a great place to start. So when we say molecular hydrogen, we are talking about the gas, diatomic hydrogen. Okay, so di meaning to uh, atomic, um, because if you go back to you know, your high school chemistry, right, hydrogen is the number one on the periodic table of elements. It's the first element that was created in, say, the Big Bang. It was hydrogen is the first. It's, called, it's like the father of all the elements. In fact, the sun um, they essentially burns hydrogen in fusion to create helium. So all the other elements basically are made from hydrogen, um, just electrons and protons. So um, that's, that's hydrogen number one. And, and hydrogen alone, atomic hydrogen, is, is very uh, reactive. And so it quickly reacts with another hydrogen atom to create di or diatomic hydrogen, which is a molecule. So since it's a molecule, we can just call it molecular hydrogen. And so this is, uh, has a chemical symbol of H2, so H2 gas. And H2 gas, uh, molecular hydrogen, is a, is a stable molecule. It, it's neutral. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's not reactive. Of course, it can be when you combine it with oxygen under a high temperature. And if you do that, then we have like rocket fuel. Um, it's hydrogen oxygen is a very explosive mixture. So hydrogen gas is very explosive, of course. And it's in fact, that, that's why you're looking at it for an alternative uh, energy source because it's three times more energy dense than gasoline. It, it reacts very 100% very well with oxygen and of course you just form water. So it's a great uh, fuel source. A lot of research is of course going in that area. But that's what we're talking about is this simple molecule, molecular hydrogen. And, and in order to administer the molecular hydrogen, talking about maybe the, the uh, method administration and the pharmacokinetics, of it. Well, you can take hydrogen gas and you can simply inhale it just like you inhale molecular oxygen or oxygen gas, the oxygen in the atmosphere. O the atmosphere has about 21% um, oxygen in it. And there's the gas. Well, hydrogen in the atmosphere, j just as a point of reference, has like 0.00055% hydrogen. I mean, it's very, very low. So it's not like you're, you can get the benefits of molecular hydrogen by just I don't know, breathing the atmosphere, it, 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 it's, it's so low, right? Um, so, so you can administer hydrogen gas through just inhalation. Um, but they've also found 
And, and many studies have shown this now, you can take the hydrogen gas and you can dissolve it into water. So it's like hydrogen infused water, okay? And, and then you can drink it. And it's similar, like, you know, if you take water and you infuse it with carbon dioxide, um, then you have uh, carbonated water. Um, but in this case, when you infuse water with hydrogen gas, the hydrogen gas does not like bond to the water molecule or make like H4O or H3O, which is hydronium ion, or doesn't, doesn't alter the structure of the water molecule or doesn't change the pH or something. So it has nothing to do with um, alkaline water. And, and that sometimes is, is a common misconception because people hear hydrogen water and they automatically think of pH or alkaline water because mm. P, pH stands for like potential hydrogen. But it, it's confusing because of the different types of hydrogen that there are. Right. Um, and, and so when, when it comes to like pH, well, yeah, the P is potential, but that's really a mathematical expression as, as, a, as an exponent. In fact, it's the inverse of an exponent, a, a logarithmic function. So it's the negative log of hydrogen, but it's not hydrogen gas that we're talking about, but, but it's the hydrogen ion, the H plus ion, which, which is just a proton with no electron. And so, yeah, if you have a lot of hydrogen ions, then you're, in the negative log of that, you're gonna have acidic beverage. But, but again, molecular hydrogen doesn't influence the pH. So it has nothing to do with alkaline, acidic water, anything like that. You can take water, hydrogen gas, and fuse it into acidic water or alkaline water or whatever, it, it, it doesn't matter. The water just becomes the carrier, the carrier for the hydrogen gas. And, and, and that's, that's another common, I guess, confusion as well, because people feel like, well, water already has hydrogen in it, H2O. But, but again, you know, it, like water looks like Mickey Mouse, right? It has the oxygen and the two hydrogens on it. And, and in that case, the hydrogen is bound to the oxygen. So it's not available, so to speak. Um, just like you can't, you know, we, we breathe the air to get oxygen gas all the time, but you can't like breathe the water, drink water to get oxygen, even though water is H2O, right? O standing for oxygen. So in the same way, um, it, it, you can't get the benefits of molecular hydrogen, hydrogen gas from drinking water um, so because right. the hydrogen gas just is, d dissolves into the water and right. it doesn't alter the water or anything. And then it's just gonna come right back out. You know, um, so, so you have to drink, if you're gonna drink hydrogen water, for example, you actually have to drink it before it comes out, just like a, a, um, a carbonated beverage of some sort, right? Mm. Eventually the CO2 will just come out and then it doesn't have that fizz to it anymore. Yeah, why, why, why would someone drink it in the first place? Like what are the like, main benefits and effects on the body? Yeah, so, so let's go through those. Now that we understand some of, those, um, some of the chemistry or physics of molecular hydrogen, um, why would you be interested in taking it in the first place? And the research has found that hydrogen has various anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, um, anti-aging, anti-apoptotic, um, autophagy regulating effects, uh, a whole bunch of different areas. So maybe we should kind of go through some of this um, to, to, un to understand. And, and the first publication that really showed that hydrogen gas does have biological therapeutic effects was, was an article published back in 2007 in Nature Medicine. Nature Medicine is one of the more prestigious, uh, credible um, medical journals, uh, scientific publications out there. And this was published there showing that um, only two to 4% of hydrogen gas inhalation significantly suppressed the brain damage that was induced by a middle cerebral artery occlusion. Um, in, in other words, they took these rats, they blocked the blood supply to the brain for a while. So we now have what's called ischemia. And that's going to um, cause a lot of problems because if you don't have blood going to the brain, you don't have the nutrients, you don't have the oxygen, you, you can't clear the metabolic waste. So have a, you know, that's like a stroke, right? Um, you, you, you get the blockage. And, and interesting, um, when you do resupply the blood and the oxygen and everything back to the, to the brain, that's actually where most of the damage often occurs. It's called a reperfusion injury because now that oxygen that's blood goes to the brain and just causes a whole bunch of oxygen to damage and destroys the cells and causes apoptosis, necrosis, and, and cell death and everything, okay? And, and that's the problem with stroke. That's a problem with like a, um, heart attacks. Um, when you have these myocardial infarctions, you know, you, you stop the heart, you get it going again, but then you have that rush of oxygen-rich blood and that's gonna cause all these problems. So this ischemia reperfusion injury is one of the most difficult things um, to 
battle, to combat, to, to uh, prevent in, in the emergency type situations and, and situations that happen really all the time. And because of these bursts of free radicals, these reactive oxygen species and everything that, that cause all these damage. And, and maybe it's important we, we just discuss a little bit about these free radicals and, and reactive oxygen species, like what, what's really going on there? Well, you know, we, we, we can learn just basically an elementary example is, you know, when you cut your apple in half, right, and it turns brown, that browning is oxygen oxidizing the different proteins and the polyphenols and different things inside the apple and so it starts to turn brown and that happens to us every single time that we breathe we're essentially oxidizing our our bodies but luckily we also have antioxidants inside of our body natural antioxidants so we consume antioxidants from you know our apple um and and that's going to help prevent that oxidation and that's going to allow us to continue going but during these periods of ischemia and reperfusion essentially you use up all, all of your endogenous antioxidants and now you just destroy your cells and, and now you, you, can't over, you can't overcome that basically. So um, when it comes to trying to prevent or cure these problems with ischemia and perfusion, there's a, a whole bunch of medical research for, for decades have been going into looking at various um, antioxidants, um, all the different therapies to figure out how do you actually get the antioxidants there to prevent this damage. But it's a little difficult because in order to prevent the damage with an antioxidant, you have to actually get the antioxidant into those cells. Mm. And that's going to be problematic because one, if there's no blood flow, well, then the antioxidant's not going to get in there. Uh, number two, even if there is nice blood flow, well, the, a lot of the antioxidants, maybe they're charged, maybe they're large, they're, they're, they're going to have difficult uh, cellular bioavailability. And that's where molecular hydrogen uh, really shines okay and and it was it was surprising in the first place that hydrogen gas would have any biological effect because as we talked about it was it's a, it's a neutral small molecule and if it's just a neutral molecule there's no charge i mean it's so small it's, it's like it's not like that there's going to be like a protein receptor where it can like bind onto and induce this gene expression it, it doesn't quite make uh, scientific sense in, in the way that we typically understand how science works, how, 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 you know, biochemistry 101, you know, works basically. And, and, and the fact that hydrogen gas does have these prominent effects. And like I talked about in this article in nature medicine, significantly suppress the brain damage with a very low concentration of hydrogen gas, lower than the flammability level. Cause you know, like we said, hydrogen gas is very flammable, but if you keep it below a four point, a 4.6 percent concentration, it's not flammable. So, going to the cellular bioavailability aspect of molecular hydrogen. So the things that dictate the bioavailability of a molecule or, or, or what have you is number one, the size. So the smaller it is, the easier it's gonna get through the cells that, or, or whatever. Well, hydrogen gas by definition is literally the smallest molecule in the universe. It's, it's smaller than oxygen, it's smaller than everything. So it's, you know, it, it wins hands down on that. Um, and then, and then another thing is its charge. Well, it, it charged molecules are, have a difficult, um, uh, well, they, they can't really get through the cell membrane very easily. And that's because of the cell, the cell membrane is like, as hydrophobic, right? It has this uh, lipid bilayer. And so charged molecules or atoms or ions, they're, they're not going to be able to get through there very well. They have to go through a transporter. So if you take something like, say, sodium or, or, or chloride or potassium, th these are just one atom, but they're charged and they have a hydration sphere, which complicates things. But that's how ion channels become specific. But the point is they have to go through an ion channel. They can't just go right through the cell membrane, even though it's just one atom, right? Well, hydrogen gas doesn't have to go through a protein channel or something like this. And then when we consider... Uh, even a neutral molecules, but that are polar, right? So it has like a partial positive, partial negative charge, like Mickey, like like a, a water, right? It looks like the Mickey Mouse, and that's because it has a this polarity. Water is a polar molecule, it has oxygen with the hydrogens um, on each on each side, and and that's that um, water is is neutral, but it's also polar and similar thing. Even though water is really a small molecule as well it actually also cannot enter the cell membrane very easily. Actually, it can't really do it for most cell membranes. It has to go through what's called an aquaporin, another protein channel. So really just trying to 
um, emphasize the fact that molecular hydrogen doesn't have any of those barriers. It, it can go through the cell membrane, through the, the blood-brain barrier, uh, through the, uh, into the subcellular organelles, the mitochondria, for example, the nucleus, all these places where a lot of the damage for, from the free radicals are occurring. Because remember, where, where do we produce most of our free radicals anyways? Well, we produce them in the mitochondria. That's the powerhouse of the cell. That's what uses the oxygen. And the mitochondria, um, as well as other areas like NADPH oxidase systems and areas, but, but these, these subcellular organelles are, are often what take molecular oxygen and convert them to cytotoxic or cell damaging free radicals. And, and that's inside of the cell. So hydrogen gas can actually get inside of the cell where it has these signal modulating effects, these antioxidant effects. Um, where, where, where it can help prevent this oxidative stress from going on, okay? So mm -hmm. that's one thing we have to consider is just this bioavailability of hydrogen so that it, it can then exert these antioxidants and anti-inflammatory effects because, you know, there, there's, probably, there's a whole bunch of great antioxidants, great anti-inflammatories, great things out there, but it does you no good if it doesn't get into the cell, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what, what, how would you compare maybe like molecular hydrogen with uh, like other antioxidants like uh, vitamin C or vitamin E, for example? Okay, yeah, so, so that's a great question because it's not, it's not, it's not an easy answer. <laughs> um, there's a lot to consider about it. And, and, and maybe let's, let's discuss the, some of the mechanisms of why it is or how it is that hydrogen gas has antioxidant effects and that'll help us better address the question of how then does it compare to say conventional antioxidants, all right? Um, well, well, first, often when we think of an antioxidant, we, we think of a, a chemical uh, definition, which is something, a, a molecule that uh, donates its electron to a free radical. So there's like a literal electron transfer going on. And, and, in, and in that case, um, you know, say vitamin C, it donates electron to, to, to a free radical or, or something, and then neutralize that, and then vitamin C, it becomes actually what's called a pro-oxidant because it's missing that electron, but it's not very reactive uh, because it has this conjugated pi structure or, or you know, it's electron. So it can, it can, it can destabilize, it's, it's, it has a destabilized um, electron uh, cloud basically. So it's, it's still rather stable. But in reality, a better definition of antioxidant is simply a molecule or a therapy even that improves the redox status of the cell. And there's lots of ways to do that, okay? Um, there, no, number one, you could simply, you could say scavenge the, the radicals directly, okay, do donate the electrons, get rid of the radicals, you neutralize them. Um, number two, you could uh, prevent the free radicals from forming in the first place. You know, when our, when our mitochondria, when our cells aren't working properly, when they're maybe senescent or they have these pathological conditions or, or whatever is going on, they may uh, be making more free radicals than they should be. And, and that's a problem. So, so if we could take a molecule or do a therapy that could prevent this excessive amount of free radicals from being produced, that could also be considered an antioxidant. And, mm -hmm. and then thirdly, um, you, you, because we have our bodies, our body has our natural antioxidants like glutathione, superoxide dismutase, if we could increase or maintain these levels of this homeostatic uh, range, then that would also improve the redox status of the cell. So those are different ways that uh, a molecule or a therapy like exercise can have antioxidant effects. And it turns out molecular hydrogen does every single one of those, hmm. okay? Hmm. You, you, have, you have the possibility where um, molecular hydrogen can react with say the hydroxyl radical, which is the most cytotoxic radical that there is. Okay, it, the hydroxyl radical, it, it reacts so fast and it, it is essentially indiscriminate. I mean, it just reacts with whatever protein, DNA, molecule, whatever is there, and, and it damages it, okay? And, and, that, and, and the hydroxyl radicals are known to be the, well, they're, they're considered to be the primary problem with this ischemic reperfusion damage going on. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, with hydrogen gas, hydrogen gas could essentially react with it and just form water. And, and this, is, this is an important thing. When we talk about free radicals in general, just to go back a little bit on this, because it can help us understand how it really compares to, say, the vitamin C and other antioxidants. Although free radicals are responsible for the, the uh, oxidation, a lot of this damage, they're also responsible for a lot of the benefits of 
uh, most of your therapies. I mean, you know, you name a therapy out there that's good for you, it probably increases slightly, transiently, the free radicals. Uh, exercise, right? Running, I mean, you're breathing more, you're, you're lifting weights, whatever it is, right? Um, all of these different things, you are essentially increasing your free radical production, even like a sauna, you free radicals and you get heat shock proteins, you get all these things. Okay, so free radicals, they're actually known to be critical signaling molecules, they're second messengers. And that's what's gonna tell the, 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 the DNA to increase your, your DNA repair mechanisms, um, your mitochondria to get more mitochondria to function better. Um, it can promote autophagy, as we'll, we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, so free radicals are so critical. Um, nitric oxide is, is, the, is like the body's most important free radical uh, for vasodilation. And, uh, and, that, and, and yet that is a free radical by definition. It's very critical for the immune system. So a lot of free radicals are actually very good for us. So we don't want to just indiscriminately neutralize all the free radicals. Well, hydrogen gas, this is another really critical area that it shines. Hydrogen gas uh, simply does not have the capacity to react with these free radicals, okay? Mm -hmm. It can't react with the reactive oxygen species, hydrogen peroxide, superoxide, uh, even, even ozone, uh, nitric oxide. All of these very critical reactive oxygen and nitrogen species, hydrogen gas simply that, that doesn't react with it. Can't, it can't do it. Um, maybe you know, based on Gibbs free energy, thermodynamically there's something, but but the activation energy is too high. Kinetically, it's infeasible. That you put the two together, it, there's no reaction. Okay. You put hydroxyl radical and nitric oxide, and hydroxyl radical and hydrogen gas together. There is that you can get a reaction. You get you get water. Okay. So so those two can react, but but that's no problem because guess what? We don't like the hydroxyl radicals. It does it does nothing for us anyways. So so that's perfect, right? Mm -hmm. Now. Um, so, so, so again, we talked about um, it's, it's selectivity, okay? Hydrogen gas is a selective antioxidant. Uh, in fact, that paper I talked about in Nature Medicine, the title was something like um, hydrogen acts as a selective antioxidant, okay? Because this is really one of the things that helps it to shine. So high bio, bioavailability, that's one difference with like say vitamin C, vitamin E and all these things. High bioavailability because it's a lot smaller, hydrogen gas is neutral, but your vitamin C is, 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 um, is going to have a difficult time going through the cell membrane because it's, it's, it's lipophilic. It's, it's water soluble. So it, it, it can't go through the cell membrane unless it goes through a transporter and it has to go through all this mechanisms and all this stuff. Maybe, maybe it's, it's going to take too long to get there. Well, hydrogen gas doesn't have to do that. And they have like vitamin E, which is hydrophobic. Well, that's going to stay in the cell membrane, not necessarily in the, go, go into the cytosol uh, inside, inside of the cell. All right, so that has those problems. So again, bioavailability, selectivity, and now we're talking about its specific antioxidant effects. Well, one, um, yeah, hydrogen gas, okay, so it has this, this, this reaction with hydroxyl radicals. You know, we don't know how biologically significant that is, um, just based on um, rate constants and, and, and different things to consider, but, but okay, it's possible. Um, the other thing, how hydrogen gas works, uh, well, we, we talked about how you can um, make the body or the cells work better so that you, uh, you, you have less free radicals being produced in the first place. So um, that's important. So you have enzymes like the NOx systems, um, NADPH oxidase system, which basically just takes oxygen, converts it to uh, superoxide, which is a free radical. And that's important for like inflammation, for, um, you know, uh, phagocytes and things to uh, during, during the immune system to kill the, the bacteria or um, inactivate viruses or, or these types of things. That's an important process. But when that gets hyperactivated, then you start destroying your cells. You start causing an excessive amount of oxidation and inflammation. And that's very, very bad. You don't want that to happen. So hydrogen has this modulating effect where it can essentially come in and suppress this, these NOx systems. Um, not, not to the point of um, making it so they don't, they're not effective anymore. They're, it's not like that. It's very mild. So you have suppression of these NOx systems so you don't get so much free radicals being produced in the first place. All yeah. right. That, that's very critical. So you have decrease uh, of the excessive amount of free radicals. So we talked about selectivity. We talked about the suppression of the excessive free radicals. And then uh, an, another one, um, which is very important, is actually has the ability to 
increase our body's own natural antioxidants. And this is probably the biggest one, probably the most important one, is, is this entire cascade that we're gonna talk about because it feeds into essentially every other aspect of molecular hygiene, all the benefits that we'll discuss. And this is done by hydrogen gas's ability to activate what's known as the NRF2 keep one pathway. You're probably familiar with that one, is also involved in autophagy. So, so but, but for the audience, um, so the NRF2 uh, keep one pathway, so NRF2 is a, is a transcription factor that when it gets activated, it's, it's in the cytosol, so inside of the cell, when it gets activated, then it's going to go into the nucleus and it's going to bind to the um, ARE, the antioxidant response element or the electrophile response element portion of the DNA, and it's going to basically induce the production of your body's natural antioxidants and detoxification enzymes, uh, glutathione peroxidase, superoxide dismutase. You know, actually, this, this NRF2 regulates uh, about 500 different cytoprotective proteins and enzymes. So it's a big one. This is, it's a very big one. And NRF2 regulates so many of these phase two detoxification, antioxidation enzymes and proteins. And hydrogen gas uh, can, can activate this, can regulate this. And when it does so, um, then during your times of say, um, your, your, your ischemia perfusion injury, your disease state, your just getting older, whatever it is, it's gonna help to bring back that redox homeostasis to where, to where it optimally should be. So you have uh, the appropriate levels of glutathione and superoxide dismutase and catalase and all these other critical antioxidants to help regulate um, all your body's free radicals. Because, you know, okay, so we talk about superoxide, that's a free radical. Superoxide is so, so important for your, for your health, for cellular longevity but it's regulated. It's regulated in its concentration and its location. And when it starts getting out of its ideal location or too, too out of its ideal concentration, either too high or too low, that's problematic. So, so enzymes like superoxide dismutase, that, that enzyme sod is able to um, dismutate or, or, or neutralize this, this uh, superoxide radical and essentially keeps it into its homeostasis. It's it, it, where you want it, both in location-wise and it's uh, concentration-wise. And so hydrogen gas being able to essentially regulates all your other reactive oxygen species by regulating all the other enzymes that regulate those by, and doing that by regulating the NRF2 pathway. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, definitely. Like um, there's, there's the aspect, because like there's a mis misconception that, you know, all, uh, all inflammation and all oxidative stress is bad and you want to neutralize it all the time so to say which uh, like you said already that it's not the best uh, solution and you know these uh, these free radicals have like a very important uh, signaling uh, factor or a signaling effect for uh, you know governing many other healthy bodily processes and you and you do need like a small amount of it so you don't want to be taking like a massive amount of uh, antioxidants on a regular basis because you may just weaken the body so to say and uh, take it out of balance and disrupt the redox balance so there is always like this small amount of oxidative stress that is beneficial and uh, your body always kind of maintains this ability to self-regulate it so to say and with things like these endogenous antioxidants like uh, nrf2 the, the 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 body is able to stay at a balance more easily so it's not going to be gravitating towards uh, one extreme or the other so it's going to stay at the homeostasis yeah yeah thank you for breaking <clears throat> breaking that down um that, that's exactly right. You know, once it wants to maintain this homeostasis, not one extreme or the other, because you can have oxidative stress. Everyone knows that, but you can also have as equal of a problem, reductive yeah. stress, right? Taking too much antioxidants. And, and now you can just think about this, all the things I've described. Now you can think about something like say vitamin C, vitamin E, beta carotene, what, whatever it is, taking high doses of this all the time, well, um, first off, you don't have the bioavailability at the cellular level as, as, as you know, very good. So maybe you're going to be in different locations that maybe you shouldn't be because they're storing there or something. Um, you don't have the selectivity. So maybe you're going to be neutralizing more free radicals than you should be. Um, maybe you're, uh, yeah, and, and you don't have the regulating, uh, you don't have much of a regulating effects in terms of like the NRF2 keep one system and everything. And so 
you know, yeah, absolutely. You know, not, not everything is bad. Just like, you know, back in the day with cholesterol, I was like, you know, your cholesterol is too high. Well now, like, you know, it's very well accepted now that you have, well, you have HDL and LDL cholesterol, right? It's better to have high levels of HDL, lower LDL. And then even that there's problems with, cause there's different patterns of, of LDL and different patterns of HDL. You know, and so you just, and it's the exact same thing with these free radicals and the antioxidants. You just keep on going down. And, 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 and some of these antioxidants, they're, they're also not just um, uh, a passenger molecules scavenging or reacting, but they also have totally different effects in, in, in the body in terms of, um, of affecting gene expression um, that could be good or it could be bad when they're, when they're out of homeostasis. So, uh, you know, that, that's why molecular hydrogen is so attractive is because it tends to bring everything back towards homeostasis. Hmm, yeah. Is it, is it because of this reason, because of NRF2, the molecular hydrogen acts like very selectively, so to say. So it's not like a carpet bomb, <laughs> like vitamin C, or it's a more, very, very selective because of the being mediated through the endogenous antioxidant systems like NRF2. Yeah, yeah. So that's, pro that's probably two ways. So one, like we talked about, just the chemist the, chem the physical chemical properties of molecular hydrogen itself it simply can't react with uh nitric oxide or superoxide so it just it just it simply can't do it it can only react with the the hydroxyl radical um mm -hmm. but then yes it, when it's going to uh regulate everything it's going to go through nrf2 but this is the other big thing because you have other nrf2 activators you know sulforaphane or um i mean there's a lot of toxic things too that can activate nrf2 nrf2 is not difficult to activate um, pretty much every toxin there is is going to activate NRF2 because it's toxic to the body. So the body's going to yeah. respond and hyperactivate this. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be good for you because that toxin could actually um, maybe activate NRF2 too much. And, and then that's going to be bad because um, um, con high constituent levels of NRF2 activation leads to reductive stress. And that's going to be very problematic. So, so this is another very fascinating area with molecular hydrogen that it's it's not quite clear why it is but hydrogen gas also seems to regulate the nrf2 activation so if you put it into the cell culture <clears throat> as an example and the cell is fine you might see some R mrna levels um, you might see some minor changes in the in nrf2 activation but not really anything in terms of a Western blot protein concentration. You're not going to really see any significant changes. But why should you? It's, it's already a perfectly homeostasis, exactly where you want it. And in, and in stark contrast, you add a, 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 a pharmaceutical uh, or some other you know, active chemotherapeutic um, drug of some sort, you're going to see changes, whether they're good or bad. Ideally, they're good, but that's not always the case. And, and you don't have that with molecular hydrogen. And, and so that's a critical point because let's say that you have some, I don't know, some condition or whatever, um, where let's say, I, I'm, I'm trying to be careful how I give this analogy because it's totally false, but at the same time, I think it teaches a good principle. Um, but let's say you have like one organ that is, is really struggling uh, where where it, it's lacking the NRF2, it's lacking your, your ability to have the higher levels of glutathione, or superoxidase mutase, and, you know, struggling with oxidative stress. And yet you have another organ that is fine, or maybe, it, or maybe it, it's even a little bit higher. So consider what would happen now. If, if you take the, this uh, strong uh, therapeutic that's just going to go into all those cells and just activate the NRF2, well, that's great. You got this organ fixed over here because now your NRF2 is up and going and your redox status is back and that's functioning. But over here, you just upregulated this side as well. And now you're going to have a whole bunch of other problems. And so, you know, you're, 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 yeah, you fixed one thing only to cause something else and have other symptoms, right. you know, and it just goes back and forth. Well, um, hydrogen gas doesn't have that, that effect. It, it like goes through and it's like another form of its selectivity, like, oh, hi, Mr. or Mrs. Cell or um <laughs> and, you know and it's like hey, let me let me help you out and and if you need uh the nrf2 higher then it'll make it higher if you even if you need it lower in fact if you have levels that are too high we actually have data showing it can it, it can lower that it has pro-oxidant activity as well to bring down the the the, the redox um position you know to mm, really okay. modulate it wow. okay 
So, so you have this, you can have this in different organelles, but, but not only that, you can have it in the exact same cell. And, and, and the more, uh, more recent research is showing that, that aging really is a problem with the dysregulation of the redox homeostasis within not only the body, but in the cell itself. So you can have one cellular compartment with too much uh, oxidative stress, oxidation going on, like in the, in the, in the, uh, in the cytosol, right? Just oxidizing everything. Um, but in another compartment, you don't have enough oxidizing power, enough oxidizing potential, like in the endoplasmic reticulum where you fold your proteins. And of course, if you don't fold your proteins correctly, you're not going to have uh, the, the structure of the protein correctly. And of course, structure dictates function. So um, if you don't have the right function, then of course, you're going to have a lot of problems. Yeah. So it's uh, like an adaptogen as well <laughs> that uh, yeah, yeah, self, that's self, right. yeah, like self regulates. Yeah. A re redox adaptogen. Yeah. Um, that, that's kind of one, one of the uh, um, that's the terminology I used in an article I, I wrote on its exercise mimetic effects for its um, like uh, you know working through these hormetic pathways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe uh, uh, before we get into that, like, uh, will will the NF two activation also lead to like glutathione? Then. <clears throat> yes, exactly. Because um, so so glutathione is a peptide, <clears throat> and so when NRF two is activated, it's going to lead to the enzymes that's going to. Um, uh, help to produce glutathione to recirculate glutathione uh, redu um, reductase, um, per glutathione peroxidase, all these different enzymes that are involved in that antioxidant cascade. And, and, that, and that also helps to address, because I know we talked about this also, but it also helps to address the anti-inflammatory effects of molecular hydrogen. Um, and again, these are um, mild, but they are multifactorial, okay? Um, and it, and it makes it a little bit more difficult maybe to study in conventional research because typically we, we you know, take something, say aspirin or ibuprofen or something, or to, and, and we're going to say, okay, this, this molecule, this is the structure, it's going to go and it's going to do this specific thing, like it's going to re-interact with these cyclooxygenase enzymes, the COX-2 enzyme, it's going to isolate the area to prevent these uh, prostaglands, like cosinoids, uh, from being produced. It's very specific and it's um, unidirectional. It's a uh, one target, uh, one organ, uh, one disease type concept. Okay. Well, uh, molecular hydrogen isn't like that. Okay. Uh, it 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 works on all these areas. So we're talking about like inflammation. Inflammation is caused from so there's so many areas, right? You have your your genes of expression, you know, and and you have your um, uh, your transcription factors that regulate that and a whole bunch of proteins. So a lot of the inflammation, like with the cytokines, like interleukin-6, um, pro-inflammatory interleukin-10 or interleukin-4, um, anti-inflammatory, um, all of these are regulated. And a lot of this is regulated by like NFKB, NF-kappa-B, which is a major, major gene uh, uh, transcription factor. And when it gets activated, it produces a whole bunch of um, very damaging cytotoxic uh, cytokines. And so the idea is, oh, we've got to, you know, suppress NFKB somehow, which is difficult because of the transcription factor. But if we do that, then you could, you could be very uh, therapeutic. Well, hydrogen gas does do that. In fact, in nearly every article, um, we're seeing the downregulation of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, the hydrogen gas is able to um, uh, suppress NFKB activation. And by suppressing NFKB activation, you suppress the cytokines. And by doing that, you're going to, well, essentially, you're suppressing inflammation. But hydrogen also has effects like on the COX enzymes, has effect on um, CFOS, um, on NFAT, on FOX signaling. All of these areas also lead to inflammation, okay? And so hydrogen if affects essentially every area and transcription factor where inflammation could come, hydrogen has a mild effect on all of those, modulating them. And again, not just unidirectional, not just one way, not just suppressing, but even increasing. And, and this setting the back, this, the stage of kind of this hormesis idea, but um, because it's a modulator, it's, it's, it's adaptogenic. It's not just, you know, total anti-inflammatory. It's more of an, an, um, a modulation, a modulator of, inf of the inflammatory cascade, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but uh, where do these, all these free radicals and the reactive oxygen species come from? Like you said, that they, they're produced mostly by the mitochondria, but what makes the mitochondria, you know, produce them? Yeah, exactly. So, um, so, so, so there's a lot to consider with that. So of course the mitochondria, um, 
what the way the way that it works is every time we eat food right it's going to go into the cells you're going to metabolize um your things to to just as carbon backbone you're going to form pyruvate that's going to enter the mitochondria as as um well it's going to enter and you get like acetyl coa and then it's going to go through this uh trigoproxylic acid cycle and as it doing this whole process the idea is you're, you're continuing extracting electrons away from the food, and then those electrons are gonna go through what's called the electron transport chain at the, um, in the mitochondria. And during this transport chain, at, <clears throat> at the last, uh, at complex four, the electrons, they end up meeting up with oxygen and protons and forming water. So we make water metabolically um, all, all the time. Every time, we, that's why we breathe oxygen, essentially, is so we can make some water. Um, and but but the, but the process of doing that oxygen so oxygen is pulling these electrons during that process of pulling the electrons you know from complex one to three or, or two to, to four it usually skip one on but but anyway as you're pulling through things the electrons through there you're creating a a proton gradient and those protons um very high concentration of protons in the, in the mitochondrial membrane space that's going to go through what's called the ATP synthase, and you're going to make your ATP, um, your denosine triphosphate. That's the energy currency of the cells. But what happens, this is the part, part to answer to give that question. What happens is during this part of um, moving the electrons um, through the, the electron transport chain, sometimes when oxygen comes, it'll interact with, um, it'll react with one of these complexes prematurely. And then you form um, by single electron reduction of molecular oxygen, you form superoxide, and then that can um, uh, that, that can go through like a Fenton process, and it can form hydroxyl radicals. It can um, it, it can be converted to hydro peroxide, and, and then that can um, also uh, decompose for more hydroxyl radicals. Or is, there's a whole bunch of different cascades that can happen. But this happens all the time in the mitochondria, and actually a basal level of that is healthy for us. We we want that to happen. But if you have, um, uh, let's say you're eating a bad diet, right, um, where you're maybe, maybe you're just not eating very good, then you have two problems with that. One, your mitochondria is going to be producing um, more free radicals than you are ready for, more free radicals than you have your NRF2 activation, more free radicals than you have availability in your glutathione, your superoxide dismutase, all of these things, and you're going to slowly start causing more and more oxidative stress. Also with a bad diet is you are eating less um, healthy antioxidants, your polyphenols. And the polyphenols are, are good because not only are they themselves can be antioxidants, but they also end up being NRF2 regulators. They're, they're, they're actually slightly toxic for you. And, and, and so because of that, they can actually activate the NRF2 right. and that can help regulate a lot of things. So, um, so, so again, so bad diet, right, is going to cause these problems. And then just as you're aging, you, right, you get these cellular, um, like, uh, cellular senescence, um, you're going to have like compromised mitochondria and they're just going to be producing way more free radicals and reactive oxygen species than they should. And that's going to overcome, that's going to overwhelm the body. Um, it's, it's just like, like exercise, like exercise is great. It's like the best thing anybody can do. Um, but there comes a point where you can exercise too much. Like you literally, it's probably not a good idea to, you know, exercise for 12 hours every single day like you literally are going to like kill yourself um and and, and people who have, like you know hike the grand canyon you know, do these like you know like the like uh you know do a marathon without training like that you know that feeling is is so intense on your body and that's because you're producing so much free radicals so much inflammation you're not ready for it you've totally depleted your body's antioxidants and and so it's the same problem with these compromised mitochondria that you, you end up getting as, as you age, as you, as you get older as well. So that's part of the reason why your mitochondria is producing an, an abnormal and excessive amount of free radicals. And again, that's why hydrogen seems to have such a good um, therapy for mitochondrial myopathy, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, the, the problem is that we are like kind of bombarded with these additional sources of oxidative stress and inflammation in our environment, like, you know, toxins, uh, bad food, uh, pesticides, you know, uh, air pollution, you know, sleep deprivation, stress, EMF, and uh, many other stressors, and they just uh, kind of overburden the system and uh, change the balance in a negative way. Yeah, we we've only talked about just the mitochondria source of ROS, right? <laughs> but like you just mentioned, 
all these other external factors, environmental factors, and radiation, um, you know, sun exposure, all of these things, absolutely, that's going to increase our, our, the free radicals a, a lot more. And, and again, that's going to, I can, over time, just overwhelm because it's chronic. It's not like with exercise, again, if you go out and you, you, you exercise for, you know, uh, 20 minutes, an hour um, a day, that's great, you know, because it's intermittent, it's, it's a short exposure, you get this heightened level of oxidative stress, and now you're resting, your body's going to recover, you have your, your genes, your DNA repair, all this kind of stuff happens, now you're ready, and you can actually handle more um, oxidative damage or oxidative stress later on, okay, mm -hmm. but, but that's because you're doing this intermittent exposure of that, right, yeah. as opposed to, again, all the time getting exposed, and that's what happens when you're always exposed to uh, the high levels of external or, or internal problems. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the molecular hydrogen is like a exercise mimetic. So um, how does it affect exercise and uh, what are some of the benefits uh, from it? Yeah, so, so we don't actually know that. This is kind of my conjecture lo looking at some of the mechanisms. There, are, there is some ongoing research to really determine if it is truly as an exercise mimetic. But what, what that means is, is, is it's, it's exercise-like. And, and, and the reason why um, I, I have that conjecture, and I, I published this paper in, in the Canadian Journal of Physiology and Pharmacology, um, but, but basically kind of go through uh, some of the pathways that, that exercise activates. Uh, you know, what, whether it's like the NRF2 pathway, um, increased mitochondrial biogenesis, you know, increasing PGC1 alpha, um, the anti-inflammatory effects, the antioxidant effects, the, even the autophagy-like effects of, of exercise. And when you compare that side by side with molecular hydrogen, <clears throat> you see the same pathways are being activated. <laughs> yeah. okay? and, and, it, and, it, and it's neat too, because some studies, especially in animal studies, but even human studies too, they found that um, taking conventional high-dose levels of antioxidants can actually negate the benefits of exercise. Because, well we, don't, well, we don't really know exactly the reason, but, but again, some of the research would suggest maybe it's because we, we get all this, uh, this increased free radicals, which we need as second messengers to induce these changes, but then by taking a whole bunch of antioxidants, we're essentially indiscriminately neutralizing all the good signaling ones, the good and the bad, and so 10 weeks later, you don't have the increased you know, mitochondrial biogenesis, you don't have the increased, you know, uh, glucose sensitivity or, in, um, and, you know, changes in insulin, um, a lot of different things that you totally miss out on and because you're taking those high levels of antioxidants. You don't get that with hydrogen gas. In fact, in the, in the, in the several clinical studies that have been published so far on molecular hydrogen is you're able to uh, uh, exercise longer, um, you have less fatigue, less lactate production, um, or lactic acid, but that's technically not accurate. But so you have less lactic production, probably because you have a better energy production from the mitochondria. Um, you have uh, lower, like a lower exercising heart rate during some maximal exercises, um, and just and you're also able to recover faster. And so, kind of the idea here is when when you look at um, when you look at diseases, okay, and 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 the pathways that are activated with high levels of free radicals, high levels of inflammation, um, a lot of toxic uh, pathways that are activated as well, uh, you know, in, and, and changes in gene expression. Those are actually quite similar to the exact same pathways that are activated with uh, what, what can be considered noxious exercise. So exercise is not beneficial, but it's noxious or, or harmful, which, which is actually more common than we think. There's, there's two ways, right? In one, on the one hand, you have um, for example, elite athletes, in order to be at that elite level, you have to train um, essentially harmfully. <laughs> um, you know, you're, you're, you know you're runner, your people are running, you know, 150, 200 kilometers or more a week, for example. Um, they're just pounding their body so hard. And, and the idea is if, if an athlete can do that type of training for long enough and not get injured, they're going to get really good. Most people just get right. injured. Uh, because it's really hard on your body. Like it's, it is damaging to your body. It's noxious exercise. It's harmful. Um, and and uh, that those same pathways are, that are activated in that case are the same pathways that's going on in disease. In fact, toxic, harmful exercise is a great disease model. Okay. Right. Um, when, you, when you, somebody does a marathon and they're not trained for it, 
and then they go and they go into the hospital, um, let's say, and they get the blood work done. Every doctor is going to think you just had a massive heart attack <laughs> because your troponin C levels are high, your uh, creatinine kinase levels are high, your ALT, AST, like all these liver ends, like everything is just like way high. Like you have some massive damage there. You know, you should be in the ICU or something, but, but you're just, you know, limping around instead of like, you know, in a coma or something. And so some of these same problems, it's, it's just a good disease model. And, and then the other form of harmful exercise, which, which probably accounts for most people um, who, who, well, not most people necessarily, but, but this is the kind where people don't exercise regularly, right? They don't exercise every day, you know, at a good time. Instead, no, instead, they are the weekend warriors that like, you know, Saturday comes, they go play soccer for three hours or basketball mm -hmm. or, or yeah. football, or they go, you know, doing this long hike or just jump into a marathon without training or whatever. Well, guess what? If you do that, your body is so, so not ready for that kind of stress. And so, again, your oxidative stress, your inflammation, your damage, everything goes way high, just like happens in disease. So, again, um, when, when you compare the, the disease pathways and this noxious form of exercise, they're like the same. And then when you compare the benefits of good exercise, okay, beneficial exercise, that's when you're training daily, you're not pushing too hard, um, but you're pushing enough to get the, those spikes in the stress, so to speak, right? And your body's able to recover and improve DNA repair mechanisms, your antioxidant status, all this stuff. Well, guess what? Those exact same pathways also hydrogen activates. Okay, your NRF2 pathway, your PGC1 alpha, you know, for mitochondrial biogenesis, your in enhanced bio um, energetics, um, a, a lot of these different pathways are also activated. So there's some really interesting parallels there. And then when we look at this, the clinical studies where we use hydrogen gas with exercise, we see increased performance, um, increased recovery, and, and, more, and perhaps more importantly, we don't see the negative side effects that you can see with high doses of antioxidants or even anti-inflammatory usage um, dur during this type of exercise. And so there are a couple groups now though that are looking to see, okay, hey, let's, let's directly compare balance of exercise to simply hydrogen therapy and let's see how much is hydrogen truly like an exercise mimetic. And uh, anyway, I'm, I'm excited to see some of that, some of that research, but it's, it's, it's quite promising right now. So I, I, do, I do think that hydrogen is a great thing for the exercise enthusiasts, both, both those on the elite level, as well as those who, um, uh, you know, go out and be the weekend warriors, so to speak. <laughs> Yeah, totally. It's very uh, interesting, and I'm looking forward to it as well. So, yes, yeah, you know, there are many things that can mimic some of the aspects of exercise or some of the physiological responses, like even the sauna and uh, like fasting turn on like a very similar mechanism that you do while exercising. And uh, yeah, but the only difference is that you still need to like, you know, get fit, and you still need to like, uh, if you want to like run the marathon, then you can't <laughs> you can't uh, drink your way to uh, running a right. marathon by drinking right. molecular hydrogen <laughs> you have to actually run right. it uh, kind of linearly progress and build up your resilience and the endurance but yeah like uh, it, it on a molecular level it activates like some of the same uh, pathways and mechanisms right right exactly well and, and one of the studies i'm aware of they're gonna they're gonna look at um they're, they're gonna just kind of test okay hey you have the sedentary group of people you have people who are exercising you have another group um that are just gonna drink hydrogen and so at the end of the study, the sedentary people should have improved essentially not at all, right? Maybe even less. The people who are exercising, they should improve better than they did at baseline. People drinking hydrogen water, how did they do? And, 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 and theoretically, maybe they're going to do a little bit better than the sedentary counterparts, but probably, obviously, not as much as um, the people doing exercise. And then there's a combination group, so hydrogen water and exercise. And now, let's see if there's maybe an additive or even synergistic effect. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah uh would it um like speed up recovery in some way so to say like or, or would it would it help with maybe muscle growth or, or something related to that yeah that's interesting that's something we would like to look at as well so we do have some data on um recovery okay so it does seem to be able to speed up some of the recovery so maybe not not as much muscle soreness it's kind of equivocal um, and it kind of depends on maybe the type of exercise that was done and all these things, because again, it, it, you know, just speeding up recovery is not necessarily always the best thing because you get better and stronger and faster when you're resting, um, 
when, when you're recovering, mm-hmm. not when you're exercising, right? And so we have to we have to somewhat be be cautious on how much we really want to just like, oh look, I exercise as hard as I can, and there's there's no soreness at all. Well, yeah. then you're probably not going <laughs> to improve, yeah. you know, uh, if, if it were like that. So um, hydrogen um, hydrogen knows the way. <laughs> I know, we, we have to we just have to do the research on this. Right. Um, but then with the with like the muscle mass and different things, it is interesting because. Uh, so hydrogen can increase like a gras- gastric ghrelin secretion. And, and, and of course, that's, that's our, our hunger hormone. You know, one of the first benefits of fasting um, is getting hungry. I mean, that's not really the <laughs> benefit. <laughs> the, is, is you start to get hungry often because this ghrelin, right, is, is gets quite high. And, and ghrelin is stand, is, you know, essentially stands for growth hormone releasing. And so you get higher growth hormone levels. And of course, growth hormone is very anabolic. And hydrogen can also in, in increase uh, ghrelin, and so it, it 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 seems that at least in some in some cases, um, people uh, could maybe drink hydrogen water, and they're going to maybe have a better growth hormone release where they can um, gain muscle mass. But but it's it's very interesting at the same time because when we give like with with like rats that have maybe some you know impairment or whatever, and uh, give them hydrogen water. Well, okay, you would think actually, based just on that alone of the increase in ghrelin, they're going to be more hungry, they're going to eat more, and they're going to gain more weight. And they, especially they have more growth hormones. So they gain more weight because they're eating more and they're maybe higher growth hormone levels. So that's just to make them gain weight. But that, that's not what we see. In fact, we see that rats, these fed like a high fat diet, drinking hydrogen water alone um, is equivalent to like a 20% caloric deficit in this, in this animal wow. study. Okay. And then when you added the two, so so hydrogen water and uh, the the fat the the uh, caloric restriction, um, you had a synergistic effect. Okay, and mm-hmm. and and so you don't it, it doesn't seem to be um, unidirectional. That's I guess that's kind of the take home on this is hey you know if you want to get you know uh, bigger and stronger drink hydrogen. If you want to lose weight drink hydrogen. I mean I, I don't <laughs> mean to be so you know facetious yeah. with that. We need more data, but. Um, that is what some of these, the preclinical, the animal studies are kind of trending towards as, 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 as this, this type of observations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. And it does kind of make you think that it's almost like a miracle drug or a miracle molecule <laughs> because, uh, because yeah. of its like universal effect or very like, uh, like, you're, like we already talked about, like these very specific adaptations and uh, me- mechanisms that don't necessarily have a, you know, um, it's not, it's not always the same response. It's always going to depend upon like what's the individual and uh, what's their state, what's the state of their body. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's, and that in some ways that's kind of one of the problems with um, more research on hydrogen and, 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 and be able to explain it because we talk about it. It almost sounds like this panacea miracle, you know, Hey, if, if you wish it, hydrogen can make your dream come true. Maybe that could be the slogan or something, but um, <laughs> That, that's not that's not really not what you know that we don't that's not what we really have or what the data is showing and then more that hydrogen is just it, it's just a, it's a very mild molecule and so I, I my my imagination is that most people probably won't feel immediate direct effects like when they take hydrogen and 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 I know people will disagree with me because there's a lot of people I know who take take hydrogen either inhalation or just drinking water and there's like I feel so much more energy. And like, they have all these things that's like immediately affect them. Some people within minutes, they're, they're feeling a, a, a major effect. And I, I, I just, I just don't understand that from, from scientific perspective. And I don't feel that uh, myself. Um, but, but it is, it is very fun to be part of this new uh, area of, of research for sure. Yeah, totally. How did you get involved with it? Like, how, how did you stumble upon it? Yeah, so I, I learned about it back in 2009. Um, I, I, I learned about, uh, I, heard, I heard about all these crazy, wacky claims about alkaline ionized water. And there was like so much like anecdotal reports that I started like thinking like, man, maybe there's something to this. Like I, I wanted to, like, like I didn't think it was going to be bad for you. So I, I, I bought one of those uh, expensive machines and I went to town to figure out, <laughs> hey, if there's something legitimate about this, like I'm gonna figure it out because I want to live forever, you know. Right. <laughs> I was like, I was quite young at the time, but um, you know, I, I wanted to figure, I wanted to figure this out, and then, and 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 then as I was going through, and I kind of, 
I learned all the stuff they were saying. I pretty much learned that everything that I was ever told um, was, was wrong, was false. Um, it didn't make any scientific sense. And I had just uh, confirmed that. And then I was just thinking about it. I was like, wait a second, when you're doing electrolysis, by definition, you are creating hydrogen gas. And, and, and that's when I came across that article in Nature Medicine showing that hydrogen gas has uh, selective uh, therapeutic antioxidant effects. And I was like, oh my gosh, I wonder if this is what it is. So anyway, I did some research and I ended up going, going to Japan and uh, uh, in 2013 at Nagoya University and researched in the Department of Neurogenetics and researching the molecular mechanisms of hydrogen gas. And so I was kind of really how I got you know, really into the mainstream of um, getting to know the different researchers in Asia and, and everything. Mm, yeah. So what is like the best way of taking it? Like, well, what, what's the best uh, source? What's the best uh, time to take it? Uh, what's the best dose? Yeah, so we don't, we still don't know all those answers. Um, we probably know some ways that aren't the best. Um, uh, so, you know, typically when you look at um, inhalation and, and just dissolving into water, you get a lot more hydrogen gas from inhalation, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be better for you. And some animal studies suggest that drinking hydrogen water, at least in like, say, a Parkinson's disease model, okay, um, the drinking of hydrogen water was more effective. So we can't really say, oh, well, you know, because the study was done this way, this is going to be more effective or something, you know, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not true. We just, we just don't know. Okay. Both hydrogen, uh, hydrogen water as well as hydrogen inhalation, both have effects and they have different effects. I, I suppose the most effective would be to use both mechan both, both pathways. You, you, you are changing the pharmacokinetics of of administration, right? Inhalation is going to go through the lungs, it's going to go right through the blood, it's going to go everywhere. Versus drinking water, you're going to, you're talking about your, you know, influencing the microbiome and positively, um, or uh, you know, gastric ghrelin release maybe, um, maybe better effects in the liver. You know, there's so many different things to to consider about this. So um, we don't we don't really know. But then when we talk about like best timing, same thing. Um, we don't really know is there a best time to do it. I tend to think it's probably best to do it more of an, on an empty stomach, just because when you do have um, a bunch of food or or whatever in the body, maybe that's going to create a lot of noise to to slow things down or or um, obfuscate the signal, so to, so to speak. As well as if you have um, uh, let's say if you eat a bunch of food, you, you, you do produce hydrogen gas naturally in your, inte in your intestines from your, from your microbiome. Mm -hmm. And if you do okay. that, then you could put possibly, um, uh, yeah. well, okay, so if you have a whole bunch of hydrogen gas already produced naturally, and then you're taking, um, you're drinking hydrogen water, well, then I wonder if maybe the effects are not going to be as much because there's already a lot of hydrogen gas present, Okay. Um, but but again, we don't we don't we don't really know that because still by just drinking hydrogen water, you actually are still increasing. You're actually doubling um, the concentration at the cellular level um, because it's it's rapidly disperses throughout the body, and so you have this 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 tangent this spike increase, and that seems to be the most important aspect of getting a, a biological therapeutic effect. Um, and then, um, so 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 with that, then we have to talk about the the dose and concentration. So like when it comes to inhalation, well, again, when we're breathing right now, we are technically breathing hydrogen gas because hydrogen gas is in the air. It's just such a small, small level. It has no biological effect. So how much does that need to increase in order for it to actually have a biological effect? Well, typically the HEMA studies are, you know, around two to 4% and even higher than that. Two to 4% because higher than that is flammable, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. It's not harmful to the body to inhale very high levels of hydrogen gas, as long as you don't, you know, only inhale hydrogen at the um, at the expense of not inhaling oxygen, because that would be bad, because we actually need oxygen. <laughs> um, but but there's no, but it's not toxic in in that way. Uh, so one of the problems, though, with some of these inhalation devices that I, I have seen on the market is sometimes they produce such a small level of hydrogen gas. I mean, 10, 20, 30 milliliters of hydrogen gas per minute. Well you know, we breathe like 6,000 milliliters per minute. And so if you do the math on that, you're like less than, you know, 1%. And so that's, that, that's, that's probably not going to be, um, you know, therapeutic, at least systemically, at least, you know, throughout the body, right? So I would, I would say we probably want to have a higher, um, 
you know, level of hydrogen gas that's going to be inhaled. And then the same thing with water. Um, if you're going to drink hydrogen water, you got to make sure you get a high enough concentration because technically all water has hydrogen gas in it because hydrogen gas is in the atmosphere. So that gas is going to dissolve into the water, but it's not going to be enough to be therapeutic. So you have right. to get to a high enough level for it to be therapeutic. And, and what is that dose of concentration? I, I don't know, but I mean, typically, um, you know, when you look at the human studies, you know, it's going to be closer to, you know, one PPM, two PPM, three PPM, you know, or, or milligrams per liter. PPM and milligram per liter are essentially the same in dilute uh, concentrations. So, the uh, dilute solutions. So, um, you know, I, I, I tend to think that uh, it's probably better in order to get a cellular concentration that's high enough to elicit a biological effect, it's probably better to take um, high doses of hydrogen, uh, you know, at a time, you know, take your, take your total dose of hydrogen or, or whatever, you know, all, all at once, as opposed to slowly sipping mm -hmm. it throughout the day, because if you're right. slowly sipping it, you're not going to then, reach the then, then. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're never going to re yeah, you're, you're going to, um, you, you know, you're only going to get a small amount of hydrogen gas into the body and then, you, and then you just excel it out, you know, and, and you're never going to reach a high enough concentration to exert a cellular effect. So yeah, I, 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 I tend to think that the higher, higher concentrations, higher doses, um, taking it this way is going to be, is going to be better. But, and then you have to test the concentration because there are a lot of products or things out there that, that make a lot of claims, but, um, unfortunately maybe they don't, that they're, they they do not provide what they claim. And so by using that blue reagent, um, you can simply measure the concentration yourself. Mm -hmm. Is there like a way to overdose it? <laughs> like what's the lethal? Um, lethal dose or like some, where, where do you see like some negative side effects? Yeah. So, so interesting. We, we haven't seen any um, negative side effects, uh, at least anything that we can really say is from the hydrogen gas. They've been using hydrogen gas since the 1940s uh, for wow. deep sea. Typically they use helium, but when they go really deep, sometimes use hydrogen, um, like hydroxy, you know, something gas, hydrolyx, hydrolyx gas. But it, it's like, you know, very, it's like 90, over 90% hydrogen gas, and they, they use it at very high concentrations and very high pressure. So clinical studies, you know, um, with like, you know, over 10 atmospheres of pressure and, and, you know, a very high percentage of hydrogen gas and no chronic toxic effects from the molecular hydrogen exposure. Okay, so it, and like I said, it was produced in our by our intestinal bacteria naturally all the time as well. So, um, you know, if you were to say, "Hey, it's, it's, it has these toxic effects," well, that's like saying, "Okay, then don't eat your fibers, don't eat your vegetables, or this kind of thing," because that produces hydrogen gas, and that's bad for you. But, but that's not the way, what, what what we find. And in fact, in some in some studies, preventing the bacteria from producing hydrogen gas, like doing a gene knockout study on them, actually can negate the benefits of the fiber suggesting that in this case, some of the benefits of eating the fiber are from the hydrogen gas. So you know, I would say the, the main toxic effects is number one, if it's with hydrogen, it's not really a toxic effect, but some people are sensitive to hydrogen, okay? There's just, there's a sensitivity. So, you know, hey, if, if you try it and you use for whatever, you don't feel very good, that's very interesting. Um, I don't know why that is, but I've heard people say that. Um, could, could be could be correlation causation fallacy. It could be a lot of you know confounds that are not directly related to hydrogen. Um, but then also, people seem to be sensitive for say let let's say that they um, it really helps to lower blood pressure, helps to lower glucose for them. Let's say, and then on medication. So let's say they take their 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 insulin and they take hydrogen, and then hydrogen lowers the glucose levels back to normal, and then they take the insulin. Well, now they're going to get like hypoglycemia, right? So you know, maybe you just, you just need to monitor, um, you know, your, your, your levels all the time as you should be anyways, just so you don't like overdose or something. And then, and then of course, you know, you don't want to overdose on say water, right? Like, you right. know, you can, you can drink too much water. If you're drinking, you know, five, six liters a day, um, that's, that's, you know, a small person, that, that's probably too much water. Um, not necessarily, it can be, you know, I've got hyponitremia yeah. is all I'm saying, right? But that's not from the hydrogen gas, it's just, D diluting electrolytes mm, yeah and uh, what's the difference between uh, these molecular hydrogen tablets and uh, these uh, machines um so the, the one of the things about the tablets and, we, and we've used them in several uh, clinical studies as well and we like we like it because of course it's easier to do in a clinical study because everyone just has their tablets and you know you can 
we can um, easily, more easily control for that. Um, they often will give a, a higher concentration of hydrogen. If you do it right, if you do it according to the instructions given, um, they can give you a higher concentration, right? We drop it in the, in, in the, in the open glass um, and then you consume it right after 90 seconds or so soon the tablet dissolves and it's still really cloudy, you drink it right then. That's gonna give you the highest concentration. Um, so when they're done, used correctly, then they can, they can give you high concentration and they're great. And, and, and higher than most of the machines have been. A lot of the machines, you know, are only give you between 0.5 to um, say, you know, 1.5, maybe 2 ppm. Sometimes there's some machines that are very expensive that can produce more. But so, so, so all in all, typically the tablets give you higher concentration. But then, of course, it's just, you know, one tablet and then it's gone versus the machine. You can just continue, you know, getting more water for you, your entire friends and family and, or whatever it is, right? Um, and, then, and then there's other problems just the consistency. With the tablets, you're always getting, going to get a consistent um, high dose of hydrogen, right? But sometimes, like with machines, you just have to be cautious because sometimes machines break down or sometimes you get, you know, maybe the electrodes get calcified and maybe they don't produce as much hydrogen as before. Um, these types of things. So they're just there's just normal things you have to be be cautious of mm -hmm. yeah that's for sure <laughs> and, and it's one of those fields where it's not so um you know well researched yet so to say so we there's a lot of unknowns yet especially about the dosage and uh uh and that sort of thing so it's uh people can just end up uh you know buying the wrong things so to say Right. Yeah, exactly. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a new fill. So, you know, buyer, buyer beware in terms of the different products and things. <laughs> yeah. 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 For, for, for the like last topic that I wanted to talk about is uh, the autophagy aspect. So uh, you already mentioned it a little bit already. So how does it affect autophagy and, uh, you know, what can we do about it to optimize it? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's, this is great. So it's very interesting because, um, autophagy, of course, um, as you well know, is very important for our, our cells, our longevity and everything. Um, and, and there's so much talk about autophagy these days. But one thing that sometimes is overlooked is that, that autophagy can also be bad for you when it, when it is excessive. Um, you know, um, autophagic cell death, um, you know, it, it can be excessively activated. And now if those cells die, they don't need to die, well, then you just killed innocent cells <laughs> yeah. and you know we don't we don't we don't want that we don't need that and um hydrogen has the ability to regulate to modulate autophagy okay so it's not just like a, a, an mTOR um, inhibitor or an mTOR activator let's say because th th those are most people familiar with that pathway for autophagy but th there's a lot of ways um that regulate autophagy there's a lot of different pathways actually okay and and hydrogen um, can regulate autophagy through multiple different pathways. Um, um, and, and so some of the therapeutic effects of hydrogen have been shown um, where you have a neuroprotective effect or some other therapeutic effect of hydrogen. And in this case, the therapeutic effects were mediated by hydrogen preventing autophagy, preventing excessive autophagy. So autophagy still happened but it prevented the ex an excessive amount of autophagy and led to higher cell viability and higher cellular function. You didn't you maybe didn't need as much autophagy, you know, however we want to talk about it, this is the kind of thing that happened. And um, so, so hydrogen can do this, right? Prevent excessive autophagy. By the same token, an equal amount of studies have demonstrated that the therapeutic effects of hydrogen are mediated by enhancing autophagy. Okay, by increasing the, 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 the autophagy process. And, um, and we can see you know, the, 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 uh, the different complex, like, you know, there's a lot of ways you can see with, with best one one and different things that have been looked at to see the, the, the complex that have been formed where hydrogen can increase this, the inhibition of, of mTOR or, or, in, or in some cases, maybe even at stimulation, for example, right? So all, all of these things um, are, ha, have been shown. And that's why I think hydrogen is such a great, um, I don't know, tag along or such a great um, molecule to use when it comes to the autophagy process because uh, most people, they induce autophagy by fasting. It's, the, it's one of the best ways, honestly, right? Um, just fasting, a good fast, get some good autophagy going. And one of the things that I'd like to research, um, but, but it makes sense to me, is I wonder if in some cases, 
um, people are getting a lot of the benefits of autophagy. Let's say that they're doing a 24 hour fast, right? It's a great benefit, starting to get into some stem cell production, and then they're gonna move on to the 48 and 72 hour fast. And, and during these, these you know, three days, four or five days and longer, you, you, it, it's feasible that some cells, some organs, some areas are starting to get too much autophagy. Okay, they're starting to get maybe some um, damage occurring because there's just too much autophagy going on and, it's, and it's, it's not being regulated as much. But other organs or other cells are having the optimal amount of autophagy. In fact, they're still, they, they, could, they, could, they could use more autophagy um, mm. if it were possible. So um, hydrogen, in this case, um, the idea then is that you would take it during your fast, for example, um, and it would go through and it would help to uh, protect and prevent excessive autophagy from going on in certain uh, cells or organs. And the other cells that would help to uh, promote and enhance the autophagy process. And so again, it's regulating the, uh, the autophagy process in, in different cells, adjacent cells, organs, different organs. Um, and, and it's able to just, just have, you know, in, enhance the benefits of, of the therapy you're already doing. So it's a great you know, adjunct uh, type hmm. therapy, if you will. Hmm. Yeah, that's really fascinating, and it's really cool that yeah, that your bo your body can really adjust itself, and and it's and it, it is true that you know, autophagy isn't always good, and there's definitely like a very tissue specific aspect to it. So you may want to have autophagy in some regions, but you don't want to have it in other regions, and uh, you you want to have it like chronically turned on all the time. So yeah, it's it's great to see that you know the molecular hydrogen could help to kind of guide the process of autophagy. You know. In a, in, a, in a very optimal manner and in, in, in a way that's always like more beneficial rather than harmful. Yeah, yeah, it's like that, yeah that, that's what the research is trending. I, I haven't seen any data would suggest, oh no, like it did this and it made things <laughs> worse or something. Um, so again, we need a more, more data, especially in clinical trials to actually test this, but uh, it, looks, it looks very positive from the preliminary uh, preclinical studies. And there's tons of anecdotal reports people, you know, have said that they're, they've, you know, has so much better fast or things have gone a lot better or whatever from when they take the hydrogen along with their, their fasting, right? Mm, yeah. Well, it's been great talking with you and we could definitely, uh, or we should, we should probably do like another one in the future when we have like more additional research and uh, yeah, uh, so far, yeah, so, so far, yeah, so far it's, lot. so far it's looking, looking good in the molecular hydrogen front that, you know, it shows a lot of promise in many, many like uh, ailments. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, there, there's, there's a lot more we could dive into um, in terms of different, different areas that where, where it can be used, different aspects, different um, molecular mechanisms, and it's very exciting. So um, again, yeah, my, my, my pleasure. It's, uh, I'm, I'm happy to uh, be, on, be on your podcast and, and share some of this information. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, be before I ask my last question, uh, where can people learn more about you and your work? Yeah, so you're welcome to, uh, of course, my, my, my website, Molecular Hydrogen Institute. That's uh, our science-based nonprofit. You know, I set it up to um, just provide education and as a platform to kind of do more research and things. I do, we, 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 I have put a lot of the, the scientific articles. I do need to update it, but, but there's um, a lot of scientific articles. You can just go there and you can learn a little bit about molecular hydrogen. Um, you're welcome to add me on social media. Um, I just started an Instagram page not too long ago um, at Tyler W. LeBaron. And uh, you're welcome to follow me. I have a lot of things that I've posted on hydrogen, even some research we've done on uh, COVID-19 um, and molecular hydrogen and some articles um, we, we got published, in fact, featured on, on one of the journal articles, which is pretty cool. So um, yeah, so, so Instagram is great. And then of course on Facebook, just Tyler LeBaron, you can look me up. And, uh, and, and again, I post a lot of this stuff on molecular hydrogen and, and things on there as well. So. Uh, yeah, that's, that's yeah, great, great to connect with everybody as well and spread spread the word. Yeah, completely. We're gonna put all the links in the show notes. And uh, my last question is, uh, what's this one piece of advice or habit you wish you adopted sooner? That I wish I would have adapted sooner. Hmm. Um, you know, I I I wish that I would have adapted sooner. And maybe this isn't necessarily true, but it's something I I am I am learning more about on the neuroscience behind it. Um, I enjoy, I, enjoy, I, 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 I handle stress quite well. I've had a lot of stressful events, so to speak in my, in my life. And I've always been able to handle it, been resilient, 
but I don't feel like I've taken advantage of it as much as I could have. And one of the things, cause I like to compete in, in sports and, 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 uh, and also like in, 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 in uh, and I just like to push myself in, in all aspects, you know, academia or whatever, right? And I guess one thing that I wish I would have done more is I think about when I was younger and I had a lot of drive, but I, sometimes you go through these bouts where, where you're just like, oh, that's kind of hard. I don't really want to do that or, or, um, or there are different things. Those are the most critical times to, um, to step into it, to, to like just go forward, like to just to, to, to do it. Because you can actually um, have when norepinephrine is kind of in the, in, the, in the cerebral cortex saying don't do it, and you just go forward and you can get some dopamine to suppress that and some acetylcholine, you can yeah. mark those synapses for like growth. And it's really yeah. awesome, neuroplasticity. So I would yeah. say um, I, I wish during these different times where, where you know, um, when, I, when I was younger that I would have like done more because I feel like, I don't know. I just, I just feel like I could have like maybe competed or done things at a higher level, but I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have that in, inside me. I mean, I did, but I, at the same time, I feel like hindsight's always twenty twenty, you know, and I, um, and I, I never really, <laughs> I guess I didn't really see like, you know, this, this life, you can do so much in, in this, in this life, you know, and, and I just, I came from, you know, from a very small town. So I guess I didn't, I didn't see a lot of things that I see now. And I'm like, man, if I would have known, I should have just like gone for it, you know, like, and anyway, I, I'm, I'm still learning, you know, a lot of these things, but I guess I'm just saying that um, when, when you have difficult times and, and, and um, the cognitive uh, stress, physical stress, that's the time to just step forward and do it. The more you don't want to do something, the more you should do it, you know? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I agree. Yeah. And usually the things that you're afraid to do are the ones, are the things that you actually need to do the most, so to say. So it's like a signal, signal from your body that, you know, this is the right direction almost. Yeah, yeah. That's where the real growth happens. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, well, it's been great talking with you and yeah, looking forward to your future work. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, my pleasure again and uh, nice visiting about all this. So. Yeah, well, I'll see you around. All right. I'll see you. Yep. Okay, bye.